there's an old hymn that I had added into my song collection that I was listening today and listening to today and God started grieving me about the song and I want to read it to you. Perhaps you know it. It's called I Know Whom I Have Believed. And I want to kind of break it down because songs are really important. They're a very important part of us worshiping. They get up into our hearts when we're singing certain lyrics. About a week or two ago, I had the opportunity to talk to a really amazing young man who was asking me some questions about Christian rock, contemporary Christian music. And he, I could tell, really just had a desire for truth. He just wanted to know, should I be listening to this? And so I said, well, let's listen to one of your favorite songs or let's pull up the lyrics. And so he gave me his favorite song and we pulled up the lyrics and we looked at them together. And I started to kind of point out some of the things that were standing out to me that did not set right. And the 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 sort of tone and posture that, that those lyrics engender. And God bless him. You know what he said when we were done? This This man is 17 years old. He said, dang it, now this one's got to go. There was no question in his heart, 17 years old. I've spoken to people my age, older, who can't let go of their Christmas. This 17-year-old said, okay, it's got to go. All right, let's look at the lyrics of this song. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known. Do you know why God has made his grace known to you? Because I know why he's made his grace known to me. Because he expects me to be his witness. That's why. Because I have a covenant that I now need to fulfill to be the light of the world. To be built by him as a lampstand. And then he places his light on my lampstand to shine for the whole world. And the way that I do that is by being a witness. By testifying to what he has done in my life and to who he is. That's why. It did not just happen upon us, and there's nothing special about us. So this has the perception of being humble, of, oh, I don't know why, you know, don't know why. He just chose me, but that's not really humility. He chose me, but I don't know why. Well, I know why, because his word tells me why. So I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own. But I know whom I have believed. How do you know whom you have believed if you don't know the things that he has said about why he has redeemed you? To whom much is given, much is required. If he has redeemed you, he expects much from you because that is a lot that he has given you. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. I'm confused. What do you mean what you've committed? Because I think what this is actually saying is you're persuaded about what he's committed to you, but you have no clue what you're committed to him. I know not how this saving faith to me he did impart, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart. So it's about you. I know not how the spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the world, creating faith in him. I know not what of good or ill may be reserved for me of weary ways or golden days before his face I see. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. You see where contemporary lyrics have come from? You see where counterfeit Christianity? God has me looking a lot at apostasy today. Falseness. That's what he has me looking at. That's what he's putting on my heart to understand and to recognize. Is all of the falsehood in which that, that people prefer. What a timely message with Christmas coming in a couple weeks and all of the Christmas messages. But this is a perfect example. I I don't know where it came from. I don't know why he would choose me. Can you imagine he chose me for a purpose? That's what his word says. I set you apart for a purpose, a purpose in him. And to whom much is given, much is required. Now, here's something else that he's put on me in the last day or so. I know that you guys want to serve God. I know that people are 
anxious and zealous to get out there and start serving. And indeed, there are ways that you can do that, that you can share the truth with others and that you can be honest with others in ways that you need to be showing up as an offering in the assembly. And if your house isn't in order, guys, you're not going to ever be able to serve in his house, like ever, because the order by which he heals you and the order by which he has you being built is as an individual, then he starts to move you to serve within the house he's placed you over with your own children, your husbands, your wives, and then you can serve in his church and you can't do it any other way. You will not be able to serve in his body unless you do it in that order. I don't know what's taking people so long to pick that up and to really understand what's required. If you don't know what's required of you or how to get there, you need to ask. But you have to understand that you are required to serve in his house if you want to be part of his kingdom, one of his priests, part of his body. Like all of those work in unison and have a specific role. Paul tells us that to each one has been given a task. To each one is given gifts in order to enact that task. And I am deeply concerned that there are those of you who your husbands are not being moved. Your wives are not being moved. Your children are not being moved. What do you think? Is this how you're thinking? This old way of thinking in counterfeit Christianity. I don't know why he's chosen me. You do know why. He has so stated it in his word. You are his witnesses, but you can only be a witness of what he's done. And you can only serve in his house if you have served well in the house he's placed you in. And so if things are not moving, if your children aren't moving, if your spouse is not moving, you have to move. You're going to have to move. When you start changing, everything else is going to change. When you are really doing the work, The fruit of doing that work is going to be that everything else will change. And so if you're, for example, if you're estranged from your children, don't start thinking, well, I'm not in the same household as them. How could that possibly be? It is because of God. Are you fasting for those children? Are you praying? Because God doesn't need you to be in close proximity to them to start moving them towards you and moving you towards them. He does not need The rules of man. When you start breaking strongholds in your family and you start looking at, well, what was I doing while I was raising them? What has led to this situation where I have separation and discord from my child? When you start dealing with that sin, God is going to heal. He's going to start healing that separation. And those of you who are not experiencing this, it's for a reason. And you need to start picking that up right now. You need to start changing that because you might have been called in, but what about your kids? How can you be saved if the children that he set you over are lost? You'd better go clean that up. And I I know that I'm speaking a message that is very, it's going to be really hard for some people to hear that, but you need to hear it. How can you be saved if you let your children be lost? Do you remember what happened? to Eli. It wasn't just his sons who were destroyed. Eli was too. Eli was held accountable for not managing his household. His entire family was destroyed. You need to bear the fruit of one who is doing their personal work, cleaning your personal house. Because if your personal house is not clean, you will never make it to that place. It is not enough for you to be selfish and self-centered and think, well, I'm doing the work and I'm healing in these different areas. But if God is not bearing the fruit, if he's not testifying to it by healing your household, how can you be saved? How can you go and serve in his house when you haven't served in your own? If you're not making it a priority to show up to workshop and do this work or You're busy cleaning somebody else's house, doing other things on the days that you need to be here cleaning your own house. Take it up with God. Find out if that's what you need to be doing right now or if you need to be focusing on getting your own house in order. Your spouses and your children 
are part of you. You have been made one with your spouse. If your spouse is not being moved, you need to figure out why. You need to start leaning into the dynamics that have been established between you and your spouse. How did this come to be that you married someone who does not love God, who behaves in particular ways? I know this is a difficult thing to hear. Again, you need to lean into that because there were, I understand not all of you were called to Christ. I mean, I wasn't called to, I hadn't been called to him when I was raising my daughter and yet I needed to clean up what I had done wrong. I'm still cleaning up what I've done wrong. When you see your children struggling and your children are, you know, violent against God or vile against him, where is that coming from? You need to take a look at that. What did you teach them? And some of what you taught them is not always what you verbally said, but how you behave. And to be honest with you, one of the worst things that you can do as a parent is to be a hypocrite. That's one of the worst things you can do to separate your child from God, to shove God down their throat and then be a hypocrite in your own life. So this is a hard message. It is a hard message, but it's where the body needs to be moving now. We need to be moving into cleaning up our houses. And I am not suggesting that you go and process, well, why did I marry this person? Oh, I made a mistake. No, there's no mistake. The Lord has brought you together with that person. Then he called you and you ended up in a situation where now you're a believer and that person's not. Is it a mistake? Is this a regret? No, it shouldn't be because you don't know if you're going to be the one through whom that person is saved. Not because of your deeds, but because you changed your heart and now your behaviors and your thoughts and your beliefs and what's coming out of your mouth are testifying. God is using that to testify to that person, but he's also using it to shake up the dynamic. Because when your behaviors, your thoughts, your beliefs, and the words that you speak start changing, they have to change. He's going to start stirring something up inside of them. And, and what you might get is you might get someone who's kind of vile, you know, you might get someone who's very difficult to deal with. And then you need to step back and not relate with them as you normally would and go to God and ask him, how do you want me to behave? And this starts to get worked out. You start to behave in different ways. And that person is forced to change because the old ways don't work anymore. So you have to work that out with God. You have to clean up the mess you made. That is your work. Your children start trying to get a rise out of you. Step back. Don't give it to them. Step back and go and sort it through in your journaling work, in your time with God, and you are going to change the dynamic. And, you know, here's the thing is doing this work with God, like, like this is something that, you know, there's a version of this, I suppose, that's taught in psychology where like you change the dynamic and then everybody has to change and, you, you know, you have a response burst and blah, blah, blah. So that's just something that like kind of naturally happens, but there's not always healing. When you're actually healing in God, he not only heals you, but he heals those alongside of you. He starts doing a work in them. Psychology can't do that. Nothing can do that except for God. I know you guys have other commitments. I know that there are, you know, different things that, you know, you've committed to and some of those things you think are really good and, you know, maybe they are good and maybe they're, you know, kind gestures that you're doing and things like that. However... I want you to go to God and I want you to ask him how you're supposed to be. What is it that you're supposed to be doing right now? What are you supposed to be putting your effort into? Because when your household is suffering and you're out there doing for other people, you're not serving God. You can't be. He hasn't given you that authority to go and take care of other people while your own house suffers. How could that be? And so what I will say to you is that this is where your focus needs to be. Your focus needs to be on cleaning up your individual house so that God will move you to walk in the authority he's given you in the house he's placed you over. And it won't be until you start doing that and bearing fruit there that you will even be invited to serve in his house. And some of you have been with me for a while and you're lagging on this and it needs to change. It's got to change, guys. I say that in love. It has to change. Because you're not only risking your own salvation, you're risking the salvation of those who have been placed in your care. Now, please go and pray about that and ask God to be the one who convicts you about what you need to do.